Wisdom attend, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be to all. And to the Christ be. The reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, there came to Jesus a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he besought him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed round him, and a woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and had spent all of her living upon physicians and could not be healed by anyone, came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment and immediately her flow of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the multitudes surround you and press upon you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone forth from me. And when the woman had saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While Jesus was speaking, a man from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she shall be well. And when Jesus came to the house, he permitted no one to enter with him except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and bewailing her. But Jesus says, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, Jesus called, saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned. And she got up at once. And Jesus directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one now what had happened. Good morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Christ is in our midst. I've had several conversations with some of you that has caused me to begin my message with these comments. The humanitarian crisis in Gaza is getting worse as we speak. And very sadly, 
we as a church do not have a direct vehicle to confidently provide direct support to the needy through the church agencies at this time. But we will, God willing. As we pray for the innocent population amidst the over 2.2 million inhabitants of Gaza living in an area no larger than Washington, D.C., 50% of which are under the age of 19, suffering what is being described as the unintended consequences of war. We also know for a fact that over 220 hostages from various countries, either living or departed, are yet to be free, including over 600 American citizens who are trapped in Gaza, unable to return to the United States. Just as food and water shortages grow worse by the day, in addition to the testimonies of those families who were brutal victims of terror in South Israel, I was deeply saddened by a recent interview of a Palestinian father in Gaza who helplessly expressed his regret for having had children who he is unable not only to provide food but any protection. My personal prayer includes a list of names of over 45 members of the Azam family of our parish who live in the center of Gaza City and who we pray are alive and who have already lost friends in the recent destruction of St. Prophorius Orthodox Church facilities in Gaza. This list I have is not without the names of friends and family members on the West Bank and throughout Israel, all of whom are Semitic children of Abraham, both Jew and Gentile, Muslim and Christian, created in God's image. Of course, we cannot ignore the inhumanity that continues to take place in the Ukraine among our Orthodox brothers and sisters. We pray that our merciful God will bring comfort to the suffering, console the grieving, aid the displaced and homeless thousands throughout the region and grant a quick end to the violence that we know from history will not bring an end to this crisis, just as it did not for generations, except to only further expand the chaos in the region. Lord have mercy. Now in taking a close look at today's gospel narrative, there's much we can learn in our day concerning what is recorded as the miracles of a woman that was healed, followed by the raising of Lazarus' daughter who had died. We discover how Christ was perceived, sought out, and called upon by people of faith. We are also provided with a description of the environment where the miracles took place. Even the atmosphere and the pervading 
attitude of the people. The reading includes two settings found in the very long chapter 8 of St. Luke's Gospel. First, a crowd of people that had gathered and surrounded the Lord's return to the region where he had delivered the demon-possessed man heard in last week's Gospel. Second, the commotion that was taking place in the house of Jairus where there were those, you heard it, who were loudly mourning the death of his young daughter. Now you and I at times have in the midst of a personal struggle encountered unexpected interruptions, a disruption in our day that may have resulted in confusion it's not unlike learning about something that we were not expecting to hear. Just like two parishioners, husband and wife, who encountered this in the past week in our parish. Times when we face undue stress, disappointment, something we don't have control over, an unsolvable difficulty, maybe even feelings of loneliness and sadness. Times when our personal faith and the exercise of our faith are put to the test. Having someone to turn to can be of great help. Maybe just to talk to or to be near, especially when we find ourselves alone. Knowing Christ and people of faith is to know such a friend, a relationship with him as with a good, faithful friend, is not based upon good times or bad. Similarly, the faith that was exercised by the woman who focused upon reaching out to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and the desperate cry of Jairus, whose daughter had died, was based upon their hope and trust in Christ. Jesus was sought, reached out to in faith because of who he was. And that was rapidly becoming known about him from what had begun taking place in Galilee. And you hear at the end of the passage that he tells everyone, don't tell anyone what I did. There was a reason for that. It wasn't his time. Jarius. Along with the woman who sought the Lord through the crowd, were desperate, like some people today. You and I know well that there are times when being desperate may be required for you and I to begin exercising our faith. But is it always necessary? To be desperate? Do we know how to trust God without procrastinating? Especially when we learn how something could possibly be avoided. Hindsight or a reflection of the past will not help anyone if we keep putting off trying to do things differently, or learning from repeated struggles and difficulties. God is always there, just as he promised. You and I know how easy it is to have an entire day focusing upon the news, or what has preoccupied our mind while on the internet or maybe a medical personal report. 
that devastates us. We know what it's like to be caught up in a mood of hopelessness over the things that we cannot control. Just like the crowd of mourners in the home of Jairus. However, as believers in Christ, we must not allow others or negative circumstances to determine or disable our ability to have faith. In today's gospel, Christ was the source and the messenger of hope in crisis. In reaching the house of Jairus, we are shown what made the difference. We know that from what we hear Jesus say and his actions. First, upon learning the news of Jairus' daughter, his words were, Do not fear, only believe. And while even being laughed at, you heard it, by the mourners, when he entered Jairus' home, we are told that he did not allow anyone to join him in going into the room where the child was, except Peter, James, John, and the child's parents. No mourners. <laughs> there are times when you and I have to take charge of a situation, especially in our homes, concerning our children. Today, there are many occasions when we find ourselves in what I often describe as a carnival atmosphere. It's enticing and deceptive, and if we're honest, it's not fun. Confusion, hopelessness can easily lead someone to despair when you and I are faced with the choice to either be strong in faith, really know what we believe, or to be part of the chaos. Metropolitan Philip of thrice blessed memory who would frequently remind us priests many years ago <coughs> reminded us of the Lord's words who said, as he, of course, envisioned us as priests, it was the verse of Jesus in St. Matthew's Gospel that says, quote, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, and innocent as doves. Matthew 10, 16. We live in a time when people have difficulty in facing truth. There is what is called being in charge of the narrative, which means promoting propaganda that uses distortions and contradictions. It forms a normality that is without sanity <coughs> and is truly abnormality. For example, we Christians have no difficulty in speaking about being pro-life, which we should, but fail to apply its full and complete meaning to the news of our day. And most importantly, being honest about what has to change and what must not be allowed to continue. There is much to gain in learning from our Lord Jesus Christ who in standing before Pontius Pilate, did not need to explain, substantiate, or justify who he was. Pilate said in referring to Jesus, Ekehom, behold the man. 
Pontius Pilate, a man of power, and who washed his hands after being given authority to determine what to do with Jesus, dared to even ask him, what is truth? It's no different today, folks. So again, I say with the words of our Lord, quote, Do not fear. Instead, let us be sure that we are surrounded in the company with those who believe, who are honest and unafraid to live in the light and to walk in the light. For as we hear in St. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 4, heard on Pascha, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. It shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. And again, in what is perhaps the clearest of the passages of St. John chapter 3, verse 19 to 21, quote, listen, <laughs> the light has come into the world, and men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practices evil, hates the light, and does not come to the light, should their deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they were done in God. The choices that you and I make, <laughs> especially in raising our children, will either be securely grounded in our faith in Christ or by our inaction diminishing. Important choices are best made with prayer and being focused on God's will. Our relationship with Christ is deepened as we learn to trust him. As with any relationship, it requires time, study, discipline. It requires taking seriously our need to confess our sins. Fasting helps when done in humility and prayer. The two must accompany each other, which we are soon to begin on November the 15th. Without that discipline, you and I are literally on our own. And we will be prone to moments of desperation and moods of harrowing sadness, easily conditioned by others and the media. We are called to be followers of Christ by knowing him, he who is the eye of the storm and the hope of the world. And so as we approach our Patronal Feast Day next week, let us allow what we have known to be true concerning might and power of the archangels, who in serving God are able to help us in overcoming the power of Satan and would like us to think, that is, Satan would like us to think that he and his angels are in charge of our destiny. 
May we be more aware of what it means to glorify and trust the Lord of hosts, whose might and power enables us to overcome our temptations and deliver us from the evil one. 